It's the afternoon of February 23rd, 2009. We're at the Eaton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. We're here for the Thomas H. Kane Archive of the Rutgers Program on the Governor. This afternoon, we're going to talk to Ken Merrin. Ken was a Deputy Chief Counsel, a Chief of Policy and Planning, and a Cabinet Member, a Commissioner of Insurance during the two Kane terms. He first got involved with Tom Kane during the 1981 gubernatorial primary, and we're going to get his perspective on the Kane years. Ken, let's jump in with your first uh, awareness of Tom Kane. What was your first awareness of Tom Kane? Well, when I was uh, 13, 14 years old, uh, I was living in Livingston at that point, and the Kane family was synonymous with anything good about the town. Livingston in those days was still somewhat rural. There was still a pretty big farm, the Becker farm, where they grew corn and they had uh, cows and it was just a very nice area. But the Kane family uh, had lived there for a long time, uh, had donated a lot of land to the town and uh, of course Governor Kane's father uh, was, was well known uh, because of his days in Congress. So it was, uh, it was growing up with the knowledge that there was this family called the Kane family that had a, a great history of doing things for the state of New Jersey. Becker Farm Road is where all the law firms are now. Yeah, right? I'd rather have the uh, corn than the law, f law firms, but um, it's a political statement, I guess. Were you uh, born in Livingston? Were you raised in Livingston? Born in Newark, raised in Newark until I was about uh, 13, and then we moved to Livingston. Uh, where'd you go to high school? Livingston High School. Where'd you go to college? George Washington University in D.C. Uh, what'd you study there? Uh, political science. What'd you do after college? I uh, went into the Army. I'd taken ROTC and um, uh, spent three years in the military. Where? Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, Vietnam. And then when I got out, uh, got back from Vietnam a couple months at Fort Dix. What did your parents do? My dad worked for a, uh, a photography company. He didn't take pictures, but uh, they had a division that worked with schools, uh, signing them up for yearbook photos, and he was on that end. And my mom, for most of my life, was a homemaker. Started working part-time when my brother reached uh, high school age. How many kids in your family? I have one brother who was about four years younger. So you went into the military, and uh, what did you do after the military? Went to law school. Where? Seton Hall. Uh, and then what? Went down to Washington. Uh, I knew I wanted to be in D.C., uh, so I looked for a job down in D.C. and wound up working for the Congressional Research Service, which is part of the Library of Congress. Uh, was the Vietnam War on when you were in the military? Yes. Did you go to Vietnam? Yes, I did. Are you a Vietnam vet? I am. What did you do in Vietnam? I got there on Thanksgiving Day of 1970 and had a variety of assignments, including a platoon commander for a while, but primarily I was working in a staff job. Uh, this was just after the My Lai incident um, came to light anyway. Uh, as a matter of fact, as I was leaving Fort Benning, processing out to go to uh, go, go and leave before I went to Vietnam. I was sitting in the officers club one day and it was late and this guy walked in who looked kind of familiar and it was Lieutenant Callie with his two lawyers and they were sitting about 20 feet away uh, having lunch and talking about the case which was then just beginning. Uh, but when I got to Vietnam they were forming a unit to uh, help try to ameliorate and resolve the types of incidents um, that were occurring on a much smaller scale, uh, uh, similar to me lie, and I did a lot of that for most of the time that I was there. Did you see any combat while you were there? Not really. Did you win any medals while you were there? Uh, I got a couple of medals. Uh, I'm not sure whether winning is the correct word, but I, the Army decided to give me a couple of ribbons. So. For what? Uh, for surviving for being there, for being a good guy. I got a bronze star and a Joint Service Commendation Medal. So. 
So you came back from the military, you went to Seton Hall Law School, then you went down to Washington and worked uh, in a, the research arm of the Library of Congress? Right, you? and I worked very closely with and was assigned to a couple of committees, the House Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee uh, in particular had jurisdiction over the Panama Canal Zone, and that was the time when the Panama Canal Treaties were um, had just been signed by Jimmy Carter. And I also worked with the Senate Judiciary Committee. So I spent about a year and a half working on the Panama Canal Treaties and the implementing legislation. But you weren't working for the, the Congress. You were working for the, the research arm of the I Library of Congress. I had been assigned to the committees by the Congressional Research Service to provide support to both committees. I see. So I guess the Library of Congress is part of Congress. Yes, it is. Um, what drew you to public affairs? I was always fascinated by it. I loved history uh, when I was growing up. I still love history. And um, the idea of public service is just something I felt strongly about. I felt strongly about being in the military. I felt strongly about serving in Vietnam, forgetting the rightness or wrongness of the righteous war. I just felt it was something that I ought to do. And so I enjoyed, uh, I've always enjoyed anything having to do with government service. What do you think uh, oriented you in that way? I don't know. I think uh, when little boys grow up, they want to be, you know, cops or cowboys. I just want to be a soldier and never changed. And I also felt fascinated by the idea of working for the public good. And that grew on me. And after I was in the military for a while, I decided I didn't want to be a soldier. Uh, but the idea of working for the public good stayed with me. So you uh, worked on these several committees in the Congress, uh, and you were working for the Congress itself as an institution. Yes. Doing research for the committee staffs or for the members? Uh, for members, for the staff. I eventually wound up working for a member, for a congressman, uh, for about a year. A guy named Bill Carney uh, is a Republican from uh, Suffolk County, New York. What year was that? 1980. 1980. Late, late 1980 into 81. I'm sorry, late 1979 into 80. Then what happened? Uh, while I was working for the congressman, I met a fellow named Tony Chicatella. And uh, we got to talking, and he found out I was from Livingston. And he said, well, I know this guy in Livingston. Did you ever hear of Tom Kane? So that closes the circle. Of course, I've heard of Tom Kane and the Kane family. And he arranged for me to meet uh, Tom. And we had a nice chat. And lo and behold, I went back and uh, worked on the governor's campaign starting in February of 81. February of 81. Uh, what did you do in the campaign? Uh, the title was Director of Issues or Research, whatever. I forget the exact title. But uh, It was a crowded field of Republicans running for governor. It was. There was what a whole distinguished bunch of Tom Kane? Everything I knew about Tom. I just didn't see how he could possibly lose given who he was, given the quality of the family, given everything I knew about him. Uh, and this is not speaking ill of any of the other Republican candidates or the candidate in the general election. I just really believe that here is a guy who stood for good stuff. And you say you didn't think he could lose your, are you speaking of the Republican primary or of the election itself? Of anything. I just really, I didn't know him. I would never met him. But again, it's that little boy growing up in Livingston who had heard about the Kane family and the, the century, couple centuries of service to the state. This is something that I could identify with. And I said, wow, what an opportunity. What did you think of Tom Kane when you met him? Just incredible. Uh, I've often said that uh, for people that only know him from TV, uh, what you see is what you get. He's just a very, very nice man, uh, very down to earth, very earnest. Um, so you were his issues director in the primary. And who did you report to? Uh, Tom Kane or Roger Bodman, who was the campaign manager. Do you recall any uh, instances where you and Kane disagreed on an issue? No. No? No. Well, is that because you submerged your opinions or uh, because you and he think identically? It was because, first of all, it was a learning experience for me. Uh, most of my issues background had been with the Congress. And with the Library of Congress, the Congressional Research Service, 
<coughs> they teach you to look at both sides of an issue because you work for Congress, not for Republicans or Democrats, but you're trying to give advice on an issue mindful of the fact that there are different groups that you're, you're talking with. So in doing the issues work for Tom, I'd look at both sides of an issue, I'd analyze it, I'd make recommendations. But Tom Kane, in many ways, was his own issues manager. I mean, he clearly had had a long history in the legislature. Uh, his service in the, uh, in the assembly meant that he knew a lot more about the issues than I did. I was a pretty recent interloper from Washington, D.C. Different set of issues. A different set of issues than I had been used to experience. I think what I brought to the table uh, was more a knowledge of how to assemble different uh, views and put them into a cohesive format for, his, for him to make a decision on. What were the <coughs> issues in 1981? I think they're a lot different than what we think about right now. Um, the, the, I think the primary issue is crime. Uh, there was a, a, the economic times were not great. And when that happens, uh, crime, violent crime, I think was the number one issue. If there was another number one issue, it was taxes. Uh, people were fed up with the tax situation. If there was another number one issue, it was the environment. Uh, people were very, very concerned about uh, environmental degradation. Uh, Superfund sites uh, were becoming um, more plentiful as they were identified. Uh, so I, I think probably crime, taxes, uh, education was in there, but I think all the other issues took second place to uh, uh, crime and uh, uh, taxes. Was it hard for Tom? <coughs> Excuse me. Was it hard for Tom Kane to run as a tough crime fighter, or did that come easily to him? I think it came easily to him. Uh, I didn't think there was anything tough about it. Uh, I remember one of the things that we, we called for was a death penalty, uh, uh, longer prison terms. Uh, and I think that that was, in the tenor of the times, uh, a good common sense uh, position to take. And on taxes, what was his stance? Uh, he wanted to lower taxes. Uh, and he, um, he, he campaigned on making New Jersey a better place to live and a better place to work. Um, I think the, the, um, when you look at the taxes, the tax issue, uh, a lot of it was hooked to keeping business in New Jersey. Again, if you look at the tenor of times, um, we had the Rust Belt in the Midwest, the, the manufacturing jobs, which in 2009 are, are long gone. But in 1981, we're just a couple years removed from a lot of the factory jobs uh, in the Northeast and Midwest uh, beginning to move down south or offshore. Uh, in, in the 1970s, the issue is why is the Northeast and Midwest losing all the jobs to the south? Now it's why is the United States losing all the jobs to India or wherever? Uh, but I think Tom felt in order to keep business here, uh, you needed to keep that business in a, in a friendly business climate. And what was he saying about the environment in 81? Uh, in, in the area of the environment, his, as I recall, the positions were more, <coughs> uh, more open space. We ought to have more green acres. Um, I'm going to forget the name of some of the specific programs, but clearly more uh, green acres, clearly cleaning up the Superfund sites, cle clearly uh, making polluters uh, act or be responsible for sites that had um, uh, been degraded. Do you recall uh, any significant differences within the Republican primary field on issues that uh, you say Tom Kane was pro-death penalty, was somebody running uh, on an unlikely but on a non-death penalty uh, platform in the Republican primary or on taxes or on anything? Was recall where any of the others stood? <clears throat> I don't think that there was major disagreement. Uh, it was the Republican primary, so it was going to be tougher on crime. It was going to be more um, uh, keep the tax climate friendly, uh, keep people here rather than um, going to New York or get it, make it more accessible for New Yorkers to come here. I think that was the basic uh, uh, stance that most Republicans took. I think Tom was probably uh, more moderate on environmental issues during the primary, uh, but I think in the primary, it really came down to regional alliances and, and um, regional leadership. How about personality? Was, was personality a part of the primary, or do you think it was mostly political heft and geography? I think personality was clearly an issue. People that I think uh, saw Tom, the more people saw Tom Kane, the more that they liked Tom Kane. 
uh, when you read as, as, a, as a civilian, when you read about a candidate, a political candidate in the newspaper, it's just someone, something, there are many candidates, but when you meet, meet a candidate, that candidate can make an impression on you. I think Tom's openness uh, and sincerity and warmth uh, came across. So I think that was uh, clearly helpful. Pat Kramer was one of the major uh, opponents of Keynes, yes. if not the most significant. Uh, how did you view him, or how do you view him in hindsight? Uh, he was the mayor of Patterson, if I recall correctly, uh, and he had a, a, um, a strong um, uh, base of political support. He was a mayor. He said he could do things for the cities. He understood the cities. He had been a successful mayor. Uh, and I think that was his main selling point, if you will. Uh, but I don't recall very much um, other than that. Do you recall any of the other Republican candidates that year? Oh, sure. They ran from Bo Sullivan, who was a businessman who, who came in and um, uh, spent a lot of his own money to become very well known. Uh, he had a lot of very nice parties that we, we missed. We always heard about. Uh, the shrimp that uh, he would have as his fundraisers, and I know that Tom Kane loved shrimp, and maybe he was a little bit jealous of that. But um, uh, all the way to uh, some some very minor candidates that really didn't achieve a significant amount of the uh, vote in, in any of the primaries. So it was really Tom. Barry Kane. Parker was also Barry a significant uh, player down in South Jersey, and uh, I, I have a lot of memories of the campaign. But one of my enduring memories will be uh, would be. Uh, Barry Parker pulled up into a parking lot at a campaign uh, uh, function, and we pulled in next to him. So it was Barry Parker, Tom Kane, and myself. And Barry Parker had a lot of material with him. So we were carrying our stuff, and he gave us. So Tom and I walked in helping Barry carry his campaign stuff into the farm. It was, it was a very friendly relationship between the two. Did you get at all involved in politics? Uh, uh, interacting with county chairs? No. Uh, no? No. Uh, and yet you were out, you, you said you just described being in a parking lot. You did go out and campaign with Kane a little bit? I did mostly to uh, debates, uh, forums, that type of function. Uh, went out to um, uh, different events uh, and met, certainly met the county chairman, uh, uh, John Renna. The Chairman of Essex County, who had supported Tom from the beginning, is someone I'd spend time with. But my role was not to um, be out there uh, discussing politics because I, I was not, I did not have a New Jersey political background, and my background as a whole is always more on the issues side uh, than it was on the political side. Who were the key people in the campaign? In the primary campaign, I presume we're still talking yes. about the primary. Uh, it was uh, Roger. Roger Bodman, who was the campaign manager, uh, a fellow named Dave Murray, who was the political strategist, uh, and um, I think you know they were the major players. There's a guy named Al Fasola, uh, who was the finance chairman, and he was also involved in the political discussions. Uh, so I think on a day-to-day -day basis, that was the core group. Who were you personally closest to in that group? Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, probably Dave Murray, uh, but uh, it was a very small group, so our headquarters was tiny. Where was it? Uh, it was in Maplewood, and um, it was a, um, a, 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 there couldn't have been more than one or two small boxes ca carved out of a very tiny space, so we were all working with each other uh, in, on a very you know, regular basis. Were there any surprises during the primary that you recall? Political surprises, no. Uh, it was an education for me to see how things operated because, again, I had never been on the political side of things. But um, uh, no, I, I'd say that there was no no shock or surprise. You were smiling though. Why, uh, just little, something about that question. Uh, little things that happened. Uh, just um, we had one event in uh, uh, Jersey City where a. Um, a, a Democrat from Jersey City was going to endorse Kane, uh, Governor Kane, and uh, uh, we went to an event at I think it was called Casino in the Park, and they had said they were going to pack the room with 
whatever number of, of Democrats. And um, we got there, another fellow and I went there early on just to make sure that there were really going to be people there before Tom showed up. And um, I remember that uh, uh, two buses pulled up at one point and somebody was standing at a um, uh, at, at the uh, bottom of the bus counting people as they got off the bus to go into the room. And um, the, the people that came in were um, clearly uh, had some mental disability. They were from a home uh, for whatever the proper terminology is. But these folks just kind of walked in. They sat in the back of the room and they were there. But whoever it was had promised a crowd of whatever number of hundred of people and these were part of the hundreds. So I did learn something about New Jersey politics in, uh, in that sense. Um, Kane won the primary. Do you recall whether it was tight or a runaway? It was not a runaway. Um, I think we had 30 some odd percent, 30, I, I forget the, the numbers, but um, I think uh, uh, Mayor Kramer and Bo Sullivan finished two and three, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, clearly it was, a, it was a landslide compared to the general election, but uh, we didn't know it at the time. What changed after the primary? When we started out, Tom would have uh, difficult, difficulty getting a crowd together. We'd go to Republican teas and Republican this, Republican that, and a few people would show up. And in areas of strength, more people would show up. In areas, counties of less strength, fewer people would show up. Uh, but after the primary, when he was legitim legitimatized as the candidate, we began to get bigger crowds. More people would show up, there would be more support. I think that's the major difference. Clearly, there were there's more support in terms of, of money. Uh, again, that was Alpha Sola's area. Uh, but just on a day-to-day -day basis, more people came in and were willing to, to commit to work for with Tom. How about in the issues area? Uh, the Republican primary is over. Uh, do you have to tack to the center now uh, for the general election? Yes? I think that we had to... Um, deal with the general election with a very formidable candidate. But when you say tack to the center, I'm not sure that we changed any of the the uh, thoughts or ideas that Tom uh, had spoken about during the primary. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I kept pretty close track of that, and I'm sure that he did not change positions during the um, the eight or nine months between February 1st and uh, Election Day. Uh, coming out of the primary, which on the Democratic side, Jim Florio, the congressman, won. Uh, did you think that it was a toss-up uh, or that you had the clear winner? I think, I think the conventional wisdom said that Florio might have had an edge uh, going into the general election campaign. What was your sense? I think that's right. I think if there was a newspaper poll, and I'm sure there was, um, uh, maybe there was even a poll taken here by the Eagle Tennis Institute, it showed that Florio led for most of the campaign. Uh, so we knew it was going to be a very um, hotly contested election. What was Florio like as an opponent? Uh, he was very um, uh, clear and crisp in his presentation of the issues. Uh, clearly, he was very, very well known. He was probably better known than Tom Kane was because of his position as chairman of a, a uh, subcommittee in Congress. He could dwell on environmental issues. Uh, I think Tom and Jim Florio were both highly regarded by the environmental groups, but um, uh, that was an area of battle. Uh, uh, who was going to do more for the environment when, in fact, both were very well uh, 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 pedigreed in that area. Was there a key issue difference that you recall between Tom Kane and Jim Florio? I cannot remember all the issues, but I can remember, I think, that we were more on the lowering tax side. Again, if, if you think about a classic Republican stance, it would be more lower this tax, lower that tax. And I don't think, I don't actually recall what um, now ex-Governor Florio's 
campaign position was then, but I seem to recall that we were more on the, the reduction side. Uh, in terms of personality, how would you compare and contrast Tom Kane and Jim Florio? At the time, uh, I did not know Governor Florio. I had not met him. I have subsequently met him uh, and like him very much. Uh, but at the time, I think the common perception was that Tom was much more affable and friendly and engaging on a one-to-one -one basis and that Governor Florio was more driven. He had a schedule to keep and he kept the schedule and wouldn't just hang out and talk. Um, again, we were talking about recollections before. Um, I remember uh, during the summer of um, 81, um, we had an event in a hotel. Tom was going to talk to a number of um, funders, potential funders. And we were walking through the hotel and there was a maid that was cleaning the floor, vacuuming the floor. And he stopped, he said hello, and she said hello to him, and he just stopped and talked to her. And we must have spent two or three minutes with the governor talking to this woman. And as a staff aide, it's like, okay, we've got a schedule. But Tom Kane was going to talk to her just because he wanted to talk to her. Now, I don't know whether she voted. I don't know whether she knew who he was. But he just had a nice conversation with her. And so I, I think people told us that was the sort of thing that, uh, as a candidate, Jim Florio would not do. But that's, uh, I think, perception. Again, I didn't know Governor Florio at that point. But that was the perception. Tom was more affable and was more open. Does that mean that he was an ideal candidate? What was he like as a candidate? The only thing I can say is that he was who we all know. He had his own mindset. He knew what he wanted to do on the issues. He really was his own issues director. I was more supporting him. He knew the state. He knew the issues. He had been in the legislature for a long time. He knew the players. He knew what he wanted to do. So as a candidate, he was ideal because it was not a matter of my educating him. In some ways, it was the reverse. Um, he, was, he was extraordinarily good that way. He was good with people. Uh, I think the only problem that we had was keeping him on schedule. Uh, another story, uh, I cannot recall what the date was, but it was his, his daughter's birthday was coming up and she was six or seven at the time. And again, I was in the car with Tom and we had a bunch of stops to make. And he pulled, he said, okay, pull in here to go into a Toys R Us. And he was looking for something for his daughter. And I specifically recall that he wanted to get her a, a makeup kit for little girls. And so he pulled out these two boxes and they looked like uh, the size of like a Monopoly box, Mon Monopoly game, that kind of thing. And he's reading the boxes and um, one said safe and the other one said safe, non-toxic. And he was trying to get someone to explain the difference between safe and non-toxic. And the other fellow was with us, um, Andy Consovoy. Uh, you may remember, we're saying we got all these people waiting, we got, but he was going to get his daughter's birthday present and he wasn't just going to get something, he was going to read the box, be a good parent, and know what was in the materials that he was going to give to his daughter. So if there was any issue, I think the issue was trying to keep him on schedule. Uh, were you concerned at all about uh, his patrician background and how it would play uh, with the electorate? I uh, no, because I loved it. I thought it was Tom Kane being who Tom Kane was. And clearly different people have different views about different personalities. But from my point of view, it was just, it was who he was. He was natural. How about that accent that nobody else in New Jersey spoke with? Uh, didn't concern you? It didn't concern me. And I think the at the end of the campaign, most people found it to be sort of charming, uh, but no, it was not a uh, not not an issue. Do you recall debates uh, between Kane and Florio? What was your role in uh, helping prep the governor for uh, the debates, putting together issue books, putting together briefings on different? Thanks. You were still the issues director of the campaign? Yes, during the general election as well. Had any of the personnel changed 
between the primary? The major change was that Carl Golden came in to be the press director. Carl had worked for Barry Parker, and as I indicated, Senator Parker and Tom Kane were good friends, and when Senator Parker lost, um, uh, then um, Carl uh, came over. Carl had worked with Kane in the legislature yes. before? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, as we're talking, different things are kind of flashing back, but you asked about the primary campaign. I remember there was a concern that um, uh, Mayor Kramer, Pat Kramer, might jump out in the lead in terms of delegates, and there was an Ocean County convention uh, at which um, uh, Pat Kramer had the lead in delegates, and there was a concern that if he won Ocean County, then it might snowball. Uh, so uh, I remember Roger Bobman had, had um, worked with um, whomever. And at the campaign, at the convention in Ocean County, uh, Tom came through his support to Barry Parker. And Barry Parker won with Ocean County, which was his home district. And um, that helped prevent a, a, Bar a uh, Pat Kramer snowball effect from occurring. So, Good story. Um, how did Kane do in debates with Florio? I think he did pretty well. Uh, I think there were, as I recall, three debates. Uh, I think that the, um, there was one of them where I think Tom Kane, we felt, clearly had done very well. And there was another one we thought he had not done as well. Uh, but I think the um, debate that left the biggest presence on my mind, and probably everybody on the Kane staff, was the third uh, debate, which was down in South Jersey. And um, I think um, all of us were shocked by the um, um, fervor, let's say, of the uh, Florio partisans. Um, I, there were a lot of very ugly things that were be, being screamed at the governor, at his wife, and it just, it, in, in the history of partisanship in the United States, it's probably like nothing, but at the time, it seemed like it was the, the mob run amok. And Things like what? Do you recall? I don't recall, but I do remember it was a very nasty situation, uh, and uh, uh, I think Debbie was very, Governor's wife was, was very concerned about that, and Tom was concerned, if not for her safety, then uh, just the, w the whole experience. Was Brendan Byrne an issue in the 81 campaign? Were the Byrne years? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, as much as uh, Barack Obama was running against uh, George Bush rather than John McCain, I think we were running against Brendan Byrne, even though I think Tom Kane and Brendan Byrne were, had been, and still are very good friends. But it was like Tom must have said to Brendan at some point, hey, you're it. And so we ran against uh, Brendan Byrne as well as Jim Florio. What about Brendan Byrne would you have run against? I think tax? the issues were the taxes at that point, crime. Do you recall any television commercials uh, from that campaign? No. Okay. I know we had them, but I can't recall any specifically. Who did the commercials? Do you recall? I should. There, there's funny Bob Teeter that was our pollster, and. Um, I cannot remember the name of the man who did the. Uh, Roger Stone. Roger Stone. No. 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 Okay. No. Roger uh, played a small role, uh, a very small role in the primary, and uh, was not very involved in the election campaign at all. After I'd say May. Uh, heading towards election day, what were you thinking about the outcome? Wow, this is going to be close. Were you? Yeah. Were polls registering that? I think the polls, our polls, I can distinctly remember uh, Bob Teeter sitting down with us and saying, well, here's this line and here's that line. And we felt that if the election was held uh, a week earlier, we probably would have lost. If it was held a week later, we probably would have won by maybe twice as many votes as we would have won by. Uh, so but it, it little, was going to be. There was a little cane surge at the end? We, what we saw was the more Tom got out, the more he spoke to people, the more groups heard about him and, and knew about him, the more they liked him. 
So we felt that the more time there was, the greater chance we had. Did he have a beer with uh, labor guys somewhere? Uh, he had, campaign? I think, um, um, Bo Sullivan during the primary campaign it some, said something like, uh, you know, Tom Kane is not the kind of guy you want to have a beer with in Hoboken, uh, trying to show that Bo Sullivan could attract labor votes in the general election. So shortly after the primary, Tom and Bo had a beer in Hoboken. Uh, I see. This was Bo's way of... Uh, yep. As a matter of fact, I seem to recall that the night of the primary, Bo actually came over to our headquarters to endorse Tom. Um, do you recall where you were on election night? For the general election, I, yeah. I distinctly recall where I was. Where? In Tom Kane's room, room at the Holiday Inn on uh, the Circle in Livingston, off Route 10. The Circle in Livingston? Yes. Off Route 10, okay. We're on route, the hotel was off Route 10. Um, what was the mood there that night? It's tense. Uh, I'd gone out to dinner with uh, Andy Consovoy and his wife, uh, Linda. I'm going to come back and tell you a story about that in a minute, but um, we'd gone out to dinner, and it was an early dinner, and we walked out of the restaurant, and somebody was walking into the restaurant. We left the restaurant at 6.30 or something, 6, 6.30, and somebody was walking into the restaurant, and they said, um, it was CBS radio. One of the radio stations had called the election for Florio, and we looked at each other, had this sinking feeling like we haven't even gotten to the headquarters yet. How could they have called the election? And clearly it was a, a premature call. Uh, but uh, it was tight. It was tense. Uh, another memory of that night was uh, being up in the hotel room. And it was later at night, maybe 9, 10 o'clock. And Tom was lying in bed uh, wearing his suit. I think his jacket was off. Debbie was there, a bunch of folks were in the room, and he was lying flat on bed watching TV. And Bo Sullivan was being interviewed on TV. And the reporter was saying, well, you know, tell us, you know, have you seen the governor tonight? And Bo said, yeah, I just left the room. How was the governor? What is Bo was not in the room all evening. He was never there. But he was outlining the governor's pacing back and forth and blah, blah, blah. Tom was lying there with his, I think his tie was down, just listening to Bo talk about what's going on in a room that Bo had not been in all evening. It was just, it was funny. So, yeah, let me just yeah, go back because it's jogged another memory. Uh, uh, Andy Consfoy did a lot of driving for the governor. And this goes back to the primary. We had uh, time between uh, two events. Actually, no, it was during the summer, so it was before the general. But we had time between two events, and uh, we're going somewhere near where Andy lives. So um, he said, why don't we just stay at my place and you can freshen up or whatever. And Tom said, fine. So I remember pulling it to Andy's driveway. And what town are we in? Oh, it was in Middlesex County. I forget the, the town. But we pulled into the driveway and Linda, his wife, is there. and She's got two little kids and mobs of kids running around on the front lawn. And so she sees us pull into the driveway and she sees Tom get out. I see this look of abject total terror, stark terror on her face. And it's, it's just like, oh my God. And it starts, you know, the house is a mess, blah, 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 this and that. And she said, do you want to use the bathroom? She runs to the bathroom and starts taking all the dirty towels and whatever. And then she said, would you like something to eat? And Tom loved to eat. And so she had a piece of carrot cake in the freezer and she cut a hunk off. And so like he came down a minute or two later and she said, here. <laughs> Cake was absolutely frozen. <laughs> Tom bites into it. <laughs> He's, that's right. You know, just <laughs> it, it was um, it was just amazing. I felt badly for Linda, but you know she was a housewife with kids, and it was a typical house, and it was just the combination of, of events. So. There are a lot of uh, little human absurdities along a campaign yeah, that, trail. That's that's the the thing that registers the most. That I, I guess I'll remember the most. Um, so Kane is lying on the bed in his suit with the jacket off and other people are around and the television's on. Um, and it's what, too close to call at this point? At, yeah, it's probably 9 to 10 o'clock at night and that was it. And then what happens? Well, we all 
eventually went home, went to bed, and said, let's get together the next morning. Did Kane, Kane, did Kane, do you recall anything Kane said that night? No, he was just kind of watching TV. There wasn't much that you could say because it was more of the same thing. It's just, wow, this is really close. Apparently, the returns came in very, very late from Camden County uh, that night. Uh, do you recall being worried about uh, any monkey business, so to speak? In the great American tradition, yeah. I, I think we were all concerned about that. Um, uh, I, I know that we'd agreed we'd get together at 7 a.m. the next morning, thinking at 7 a.m. we'd have some result. Tom was not there, but the rest of the staff was, was there. And it was at the Holiday Inn in Livingston where we had that breakfast. And we thought we'd have something at 7 a.m., but we, we clearly did not. I think one of the issues of concern running up to the election was quote unquote funny business that might occur. Uh, again, I was not the political guy, uh, but I do remember that there was a concern that there might be votes that showed up late from uh, Camden County. So tell us the story of the recount, uh, which I guess it became clear that next day that there was going to need to be a recount. Did somebody call for a recount, or was it the state that just said we we declare a recount? Do you, no, do you again, recall? my I can't recall the specific uh, uh, events uh, in any kind of chronological order, but clearly there was a, a, a recount. Uh, clearly we. Um, uh, brought in lawyers uh, to help us. Uh, they had the other side had lawyers to help them, and it just got caught up in a. It wasn't as bad as the the hanging Chad thing from 2000, but uh, people were looking at the votes and. Um, what was your role during that period? Keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think uh, we went ahead and started planning, saying you know he he may wind up the winner. We expect he'll wind up the winner, uh, and we're going to prepare for the administration as if he were going to be the governor. We've gotten a sense from some of the other interviews we've done that the, that the Kane camp, from a strategic point of view, handled the recount period better than the Florio camp. Uh, does that, any of that? I can't recall. Okay. Again, I was not involved in that on a day-to-day -day basis, so. Uh, I actually think Erwin Kimmelman became the lead lawyer for us on the recount, and he later became the first attorney general. I think what we were told was that the Kane campaign would hold a press conference every day to update the press, and that the Florio campaign uh, didn't match that, and therefore the press uh, was more susceptible to Kane spin than Florio spin, and it created a uh, a sense that uh, things were looking stronger for Kane. I, I, I'm yeah. not, does that ring any bell? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, what does this do to your personal life? This uh, turmoil. The one good thing I've heard this from so many people uh, who've worked in political campaigns. Uh, both before and since, was that the best thing about a p political campaign is you know it's going to end on a certain day. And it didn't. <laughs> it just kind of continued, and we didn't know how long that was going to go on. Where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living in Livingston. I was actually, um, I, for that part of the campaign, I was living with my parents who still had a place in Livingston and going back and forth between Washington on weekends, which I'm still doing, so nothing's changed. Uh, were you getting paid uh, after the campaign, do you recall? Uh, I do not recall. I know whatever the pay was during the campaign was campaign salary. It was not very much so. Didn't really matter. Yeah, it was not. Uh, I didn't come up for the, the salary on the primary campaign or the general campaign. Uh, how old are you in 1981? 34. 34. So uh, your future is hanging in the balance here during this recount. You're either going to go to Trenton with a new governor or be looking back for a job. Washington, or no. back to Washington. Um, so you had a lot riding on the outcome. Yeah. You had a lot emotionally also riding on the outcome. Sure. You had invested nine months of your life in this. Yeah. 
What did you think of Tom Kane by the end of that campaign? Uh, you told us you liked him instantly when you met him. Yeah, I, I thought more. You know, whatever I had felt at the beginning, I felt more. Uh, just he, he was very honorable, uh, very decent. Um, uh, what he said was what he meant. You know, I, I never ever heard him say, "Well, we can do this," and then it, it just whatever he said, he meant, and he handled people properly. Uh, I could tell you other stories about the ones similar to the one I told you about the maid, where he just he, he treated everybody with respect, whether they're voting for him or not, or even whether they knew there was an election going on. Would you say he was a natural politician? I don't know what that is. I think if you look around the country, you'll see different people that are politicians that have different styles. What sells in New Jersey might not sell in Texas. What sells in Florida might not sell in California. Uh, but I think that he appealed to the better part of what people saw about what New Jersey could be. Um, I, I think one of the things about the Kane administration we might talk about later on is the perception of New Jersey. And I think, I'd like to think that people saw the inherent good in Tom and, and translate that into what he might bring to the governorship. What was the perception of New Jersey within New Jersey in 1981? I think we were reeling. I think the economy was hurting. Again, go back to the, the Northeast, Midwest, Rust Belt kind of thing. We lost a lot of jobs. There were a lot of environmental problems. Uh, there were um, issues uh, involving corruption. There were still issues involving corruption. Um, there was a concern that uh, uh, New Jersey was not the place that it once was. Uh, again, if you go back and look at it, the tenor of the times, I remember growing up in New Jersey in the 1950s when it was still an agrarian state. And we went through a lot in the period between, 19, say, 1960 and 1980. So if, if you're voting in 1981 and that's your voting history, say, okay, this state has changed a lot. And I think people had a yearning for maybe a more simplistic time when govern, government was doing more for people or perceived as doing more for people. Do you recall the end of the recount? Um, Do you recall the victory? I don't, but it's just we won. And at that point, uh, I'd been assigned to go down to Trenton, and I was traveling down there on a daily basis. I think that's where I first met uh, Don Lakey and some other people from the uh, Byrne administration. Who assigned you to do that? Tom. Tom Kane? Yep. Go I, I don't remember whether Tom said it himself to me or someone else said, okay, go down and start analyzing things, see what's there. And I think that began the day that we were designated as the, uh, the winner. Did the recount affect the transition? Uh, Clearly it threw it back. I, I know that we had... Um, Tom was, uh, Tom had asked his people, not me, but other folks, for a list of possible candidates for commissionerships, for jobs. And I think the amount of personal time it took him and the staff to deal with the recount, the issues, the press, I think it all delayed that for a while. So yes, it, it definitely delayed that uh, process. Um, was there a specific conversation where you were asked to take a particular job in the administration? No. No? No. It was just go down and, and uh, kind of sort out what's going on. In terms of, you know, what space is available, what issues are pending, what bills are pending that the governor, Governor Kane might have to deal with uh, in the new legislature. In other words, things that Governor Byrne might not sign uh, while he was still there. So it was sort of the, um, see what the staff is like. Uh, I, I wound up working in the council's office, but I remember interviewing some of the secretaries. So you interfaced with Don Linke, who was chief of policy and planning at the yeah. time? And do you remember who the council was? You were council at the time. Council. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Um, did anybody else do that p job, that liaison job, or was that you solely? It was primarily me. Um, I think there were other people going down for other reasons, but that's what I w that's how I was spending my time between, uh, let's say, late November and January. And what was your first position in the, in the administration? Uh, Deputy Chief Counsel. So Carrie Edwards point, was the General Counsel. Carrie Chief Edwards. Counsel, right. And then I worked as his number two. Uh, this is the first mention of his name. What, when did he come into the picture? 
uh, sometime late in the primary. I'm saying late um, April or May. And what role did he play during the general election? Uh, he had endorsed Tom again in April or May of the primary season, and then he was an issues advisor, a surrogate speaker. Uh, and so he was named chief counsel, and did he choose you, or did Kane assign you to him? Do you know? I can't remember. Uh, what was your job uh, in the early days of the Kane administration? We had um, uh, to assemble legal staff. As I recall, we kept about half the lawyers that uh, had worked for Don, uh, Amy Pirro, uh, uh, Jack Trope, um, a couple of others. I, I'm forgetting some of the names, but uh, we had to hire some new folks to work in the counsel's office. So we did a lot of interviews. Uh, we had to set up a process and a procedure that worked for us. We kind of tweaked a little bit what, um, what Don had used. I think our past bill memos probably look pretty much like your past bill memos. What are uh, past bill memos? Uh, past bill memo basically would be, here's the attached bill. This is what it says. This is what it does. Here are the concerns. Frequently, there are technical concerns about bills like they want to do this, but they didn't word it properly, so we've got to conditionally veto the bill just to correct the language, or in some cases there are substantive issues about the legislation. I think Kerry Edwards told me that he downsized, told us that he downsized the, the, no. the staff. No. no. Upsized. No. He upsized? Dramatically. Oh, yeah. cold. Yeah. Cold. cold downsized. Yeah. Okay. It, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a large, large number by the time. Because I remember we just kept eating up space in the uh, state house. Uh -huh. uh, From five to twenty-five. Yeah, it was just huge by the time. I mean, I left by '84 and it kept growing. I left in March of '84, and we had d at least doubled what you had, and it just kept growing and growing by leaps and bounds. Were different. Uh, were you the deputy chief yep. counsel? You were the number two. Right. Did you have a portfolio of certain departments, certain issues? Yeah, I was, uh, my job number one was with the quality control, but I was basically the person whom all the technical stuff had to go through to get to the governor. So all the assistant counsels had to review different bills. I look at their reviews, their analyses, and then it would go up to Kerry and then to the governor. So from a legal perspective, everything was funneled through me. And then I had three issue areas, as I recall. One was uh, the urban enterprise zone, which was a priority of the governor's. Uh, the other one was auto insurance. And I was thinking all the way down here, what was the third one? I know I had three, and for the life of me, I can't remember what the third one had was. Had urban enterprise zones come into existence by that point in time? Uh, Jack Kemp uh, had been pushing them. I think they existed in a couple of areas. Uh, but if they did, they were relatively new at that point. But in New Jersey? No. Uh, this was an fact, initiative of the my, my job was to help get an urban enterprise zone built through a legislature that was in Democratic hands and was not very responsive to the governor's initiatives, with the exception of the uh, uh, anti-crime stuff. Who were the other key members of the governor's staff besides Carrie Edwards? Initially, uh, it was uh, a troika. Uh, Lou Thurston was the chief of staff, and uh, Gary Stein was head of policy and planning. And Carl Golden was running the press office, so I'd say that was the core group. When you think of the, well, let me amend that direction. Um, Kane ran on lower taxes, but he was forced to raise taxes in his first year in office. Tell, that, tell us that, that story from your perspective. Well, I think during the campaign, uh, uh, the, the income tax um, uh, was initiated under the Byrne administration. Uh, there's still a great deal of, of anger about that, particularly in the Republican Party. And I think um, from what I can recall, no one was real happy about it. Uh, so there was a concern about that, but there's also a concern about making New Jersey a, a better place for business, getting businesses to stay here. So there are corporate tax issues. There were all the, the issues, the same discussions about taxes that are occurring in Washington right now were occurring here back then. Only here it was more direct in the sense of jobs. If business taxes are lower, companies will move here from New York. Same issue. I think Jersey City is trying to pull businesses out of New York City right now 
taxes are fueling all of it, so it was the same argument. Uh, when um, we were running, everyone said there was going to be a deficit. You can't lower taxes when there's this big deficit. Uh, and based on the analysis that we had during the primary in general, we felt we could. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, there was um, one of the, the I'm flashing back now, one of the um, part of the impetus for the Kane campaign during the primary was there was an article in Newsweek magazine in the, the old Periscope section of Newsweek, which kind of focused on the Kane tax plan. Uh, but when the governor was elected, came into office, looked at the budget, saw that it couldn't be done, and so initially did uh, raise taxes. Do you recall whether he raised the tax that he proposed raising or whether the Democratic-controlled legislature forced him to raise a different tax? I honestly cannot remember. I do remember that um, there was an effort to raise taxes uh, to a much higher level than Tom wanted. I think on the income tax in particular, uh, Alan Karcher, who was the Speaker of the Assembly at that point, wanted to have a, a tax at a, a higher level than what Governor Cain ultimately wound up signing. Do you recall anything about the governor holding his nose when he signed that tax bill? Uh, there were a couple of uh, bills that the governor signed that I particularly remember him holding his nose on. And uh, literally, I, I think that literally? well, no, not literally, but uh, there are a couple of bills that that were signed. Uh, that was one. And again, as as other people will tell you, as you, as you look at the history of the Cain administration, he did repeal the some of the taxes or rescind some of the taxes as the administration went forward and the economic situation permitted tax reduction? Uh, I believe the death penalty was reinstated in 1982, his first year in office. Uh, was that a, a high point of the, uh, of the first year in office? Right. The first year, the economy was still terrible. And uh, there was there was very little. There was still this this um, battle. The Democratic legislature was trying to figure out how to deal with a Republican governor, and the Republican governor was looking for allies in a Democratic legislature. Uh, and I think this is one area that, uh, again, going back to how important an issue crime was during the campaign, um, it was an issue that we. Uh, I don't recall we had a lot of trouble getting through the legislature. I think we had a lot of Democratic support for that. Uh, and my, my uh, again, my uh, flashing back to these recollections, there were two bills. One was the death penalty, and then the second bill was the type of, uh, or the manner of execution. Um, and there was a senator from Hudson County uh, named Chris Jackman, uh, Chrissy Jackman at the time, and they were debating different options. And I, I remember him voting against lethal injection because, in Chrissy's words, it wasn't tough enough <laughs> and <laughs> from the floor of the Senate. Um, so, but the, the, the death penalty itself went through fairly quickly. Uh, the council's office took on a stronger budget role uh, when Carrie Edwards was mm -hmm. chief counsel. Uh, do you recall any conflicts uh, with the Treasury Department or OMB uh, over budget? Responsibility. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, definitely. I can remember, again, it's a new administration. In any administration, people jockey for a position. Uh, and that's not necessarily a negative term. It's just who's responsible for what, who's going to take on what, who's going to be listed to. Uh, the treasurer was Ken Biederman. Um, and um, uh, as I recall, Ken did not have a strong background. I think he's out of Delaware, as, as I recall. but. There was an issue about who was going to be responsible for putting the budget together. Um, and again, this was in a year in which the economy was really bad, so there were people were looking at cutbacks, and it was, it was difficult formulating that budget. Uh, Carrie Edwards uh, was an extremely bright, articulate, young former legislator um, who had been enmeshed in these issues during his years in the legislature. And I think he, um, uh, in putting the budget together and working through the legislature, um, probably stepped on some toes. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but. Toes within the administration yes. or legislative toes? Uh, probably both, but right now I'm talking about within the administration. Uh, well, he would have known more about New Jersey budgets than yeah. Biederman from another state, right? 
Uh, yeah, again, from Biederman's position, he's the treasurer. Uh, the budget, uh, I think it was Ed Hofkazang was working for him at the time, and then Dick Stanford later took over it. Traditionally came out of there. Now, I'm not sure under Governor Byrne who put it together or how it was done then, but uh, uh, I think Ken's position was, hey, it's my responsibility. I'm going to do it. Um, how long did you stay in the council's office? Two years. What do you recall as uh, your major issue or uh, bill or accomplishment during those two years? The Urban Enterprise Zone bill, working with uh, a very bright uh, senator from uh, uh, Middlesex County named John Lynch, uh, who uh, uh, was very, very knowledgeable. Uh, in my discussions with him, um, they were all public policy, public interest. It was clear he wanted New Brunswick included as one of the urban enterprise zone cities. Uh, but um, uh, it was great working with him because, again, his his focus was public policy, public interest. Uh, and then auto insurance dominated uh, the two years that I spent in the uh, council's office. How? Auto insurance had been a mess in New Jersey for many years. Uh, going back to the 1960s, uh, uh, we enacted, uh, the state enacted no fault auto insurance. Uh, there were some problems with the bill uh, that was signed, problems in the sense there were a lot of changes made at the last minute. Uh, the system never really made any sense. Uh, the whole way it was done was out of whack. Uh, rates had been going up for the uh, during throughout the Byrne administration, uh, I think that was um, if there was a, a, a beyond taxes and crime and environment, auto insurance was out there. Uh, you got to do something about auto insurance rates. So again, the idea is to get something through the legislature. Um, Governor Kane's position during the primary and during the general election was enact a verbal threshold, which would restrict the right to sue, which would help lower costs. And that was one thing that was not going to pass the Democratic legislature. Uh, so we explored many different options. And in, I think, February of 83, uh, the governor finally signed a bill into law. And it was another one of those things that he had to, if not literally, hold his nose on and, and say, I'm signing this because it's the only thing I've got. But I've been told if I sign this, then I will get a verbal threshold bill or get a, a higher threshold uh, bill, monetary threshold. and. Um, I'm signing this for that reason. And indeed, in a few months, he did get a, a different monetary threshold. Do you remember what this bill did? The, this the bill created a new residual market called a Joint Underwriting Association, which replaced the old assigned risk plan. It too would become famous, uh, oh, JUA. Would. Yes. Um, one of Governor Florio's best campaign lines in 1989 when he was running for the governorship that he did win was uh, JUA DOA, which I kind of liked, but I wasn't in a position to say so. I don't think he would have won me too, but. Uh, do you recall any legislators you worked with when you were in the council's office to get either the, oh, you well, talked well, about John Lynch. Anybody yeah, else you worked with, uh, auto insurance or anything? Auto other? insurance, the key one was, uh, uh, Mike Adubato. Uh Before I get to Mike, the other legislator I had frequent dealings with was a fellow from Hudson County named uh, Bobby Januszewski, uh, who also was a pleasure to work with. He was one of the brightest legislators that I met down there and had a great command of the budget and great command of other issues. So, um, The sense of irony in your voice yeah. is because Januszewski and Lynch would, many years later, uh, get convicted of corruption charges. Yes. But, yeah. but your experience with them was wholly positive. Totally positive. And uh, uh, they're both uh, gentlemen, both very, very bright and very, very concerned about the public good. Uh, but in Mike Adubato was uh, unique. Um, Mike was from Newark, and uh, he was an insurance agent, a life insurance agent, and he took auto insurance on as an issue uh, because um, his his district in Newark uh, was an urban area and the rates were ridiculously high. So uh, he uh, locked horns with uh, Governor Byrne and his staff for a number of years and um, 
uh, he had total power over auto insurance in the assembly. He was uh, chairman of the assembly insurance committee? Yes, and he, through the political organization in Essex County, and Hudson County controlled five votes. And if you look at the majority that Alan Karcher had when he got elected as speaker, it was essentially Mike's votes. Uh, so if Mike were to withdraw his support, then Karcher would no longer be speaker. So the deal Mike had was, you're speaker, you do what you want, but leave me alone on car insurance and support what I, so that was the deal. And Mike uh, was the brother of Steve, Steve Adam Senior. Adam, right, who runs the North Ward Center and um, does a great job up there. Uh, Alan Karcher was their leader. What was he like? Uh, I didn't deal with Alan directly on too many issues, but I think he saw himself as the the democratic leader of the state uh, after Governor um, uh, Burns' departure from Trent Trenton, and he felt that his role was to say no to anything that Governor Kane wanted, either because he really didn't believe in it, public policy grounds, or political reasons. If you deny the Republicans a victory, then it's hard to reelect the Republicans. So choose one or the other. Um, what did you do after two years? What, what was your next assignment? Uh, the insurance commissioner uh, at the time, uh, Joe Murphy, uh, had locked horns with uh, Mike Adubato and uh, did not come out on top. Uh, there were some issues involving the way he administered uh, the law that had recently been passed, and um, uh, he resigned uh, under fire in March or April, I think April of uh, 1984. And I had been sent over there as deputy commissioner about 30 days before he left. So you became commissioner? Acting commissioner, Acting and then commissioner. a few months later, I think in June, I became commissioner and stayed as commissioner until December of that year. So I was commissioner for about acting or commissioner for about seven months. And uh, which, which did you prefer, being deputy chief counsel or acting commissioner of insurance? I loved working in the state house. I loved all the action in the state house. But there is so much wrong at the insurance department uh, that for six or seven months, I really enjoyed what I was doing there. Um, but I ultimately came back to the State House, which is what I wanted to do. Uh, did you have much effect on correcting what was wrong at the department? I tried to. I think I did um, uh, then and when I went back the second time. Um, the, the biggest problem with the insurance department was it was in a, a time warp. Uh, uh, we'd had something called the Governor's Management Improvement Commission when Governor Kane came in, which analyzed issues with various departments. They didn't look at the smaller departments, including insurance. So when I went over, I had them come in and look at it. And what they found was that everything that was wrong in any other department was wrong at the insurance department. Plus, they found a whole bunch of things that was that were unique to the insurance department. Um, the biggest thing is that um, from a equipment standpoint, we didn't have anything. We, we had a few electric typewriters. Uh, there's something called a mag card typewriter, and I forget what they actually did, but we had one or two of those. But we literally had people um, working with fountain pens, uh, trying to record and analyze what the insurance companies were doing. Um, the people were, for the most part, elderly. They'd been there for a long time. Um, uh, there were laws that were enacted by the state of New Jersey in 1920 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 that had never been updated. Uh, the National Insur Association of Insurance Commissioners um, had put out model laws. These are not partisan types of things, just solvency. Just They've been through two or three iterations in the decades since our laws were enacted. And they just weren't touched. So the laws were antiquated. The department had never implemented any of the, the rules that would support those departments or su support those laws. Uh, they didn't have the equipment to do what they were supposed to do. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. Uh, they were obeying laws that 
didn't exist. In other words, there were just rooms that had papers piled in them. I said, what are you keeping these for? And they said, well, the law requires us to. And I said, which law? Turns out there was no law. Uh, there were, um, uh, there's one room where, where these women that were responsible for doing license renewals were working. And there was a machine that was making this infernal racket. I cannot tell you how loud it was, this pounding noise. And these six or eight women were working there day after day. There had to be hearing loss. I can still not understand how the, the state workers union permitted that to go on for years, for decades. Um, the, um, uh, I got in and there was a, a flag behind the commissioner's desk. And after a couple weeks, it didn't look right. And I just unfurled it at 48 stars. Alaska and Hawaii had been admitted in 1959. This is 1984. It, it just, it was, a, it was, um, um, what's that, that movie, um, um, where, uh, uh, Wake Up in Scotland in that town that comes alive, comes alive every hundred years? Brigadoon. It was like Lanny and Brigadoon. It's like, it was this time warp. And, so when you think about it, all these laws on the books passed by legislatures, signed by governors over decades and decades, not partisan laws, not car just never enforced. Nothing was done. So I think what I did the first year was to bring that to the attention of the legislature. The press wrote a lot of really interesting articles about it. And so we really began ramping up the budget, getting more equipment, getting more qualified people, doing things that had to be done to get it to get the department off of life support. And Again, that, that kept going throughout the 1980s. What, what do you think the key difference is between being a member of the governor's staff and being uh, a high-level manager in one of the government departments? Governor's staff, at least in the position that I was in, you're involved in just about everything. And you could be involved in everything. And you knew everything that was going on. You're with the legislators. You saw all the action. And so it was a hands-on approach where you're it was sort of like a buffet table of issues. You could jump into everything. With any department, your issues were clearly delineated. You are still involved in the, um, the, the buffet style, but it's, it's limited. It's just dessert or just, just entrees, but it's, it's not the entire buffet. And it's a lot of hands-on management issues. You have to be involved in not just saying, here's something that would be good, a cleaner environment, but how do we actually do how do we achieve the goal that everybody has said that we should achieve? Let's take a break, all right? Sure. Is this what you want? Absolutely. Ten minutes. We only Go have ahead. ten minutes of yeah, tape left? Ten minutes on this tape, yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, I want to say something that's off the tape. Okay, turn. Oh, off? Yeah. I don't know. We have 11, 11 minutes left on this tape. Okay. How is Tom Kane doing by this point? We're now into the second, third year of his administration. There was a sense that the first year was rocky and the economy was not good that first year and he had to raise taxes. How was he doing by the end, t t towards the end of the first term? I think, and again, I went over halfway through the first term, but I think at that point there was already a turnaround. A lot of it has to do with Greg Stevens, uh, of the Troika, of Lou Thurston, Kerry Edwards and Gary Stein. The first to leave was Lou Thurston. Um, and Greg Stevens, uh, I'm sure other people will talk about his, his background, uh, but Greg had known Tom for a number of years at that point. Uh, Tom had a great deal of confidence in Greg. I think Greg pushed for a lot more action, a lot more aggressive in saying we're going to get out, whatever it is we're going to do. Greg didn't make policy, but rather than sit and think, get out and do it. And he also got Tom Kane out more out in the public view, got him out talking to people because Tom Kane was Tom Kane's best asset. It wasn't the staff, it wasn't the cabinet. Tom Kane's best asset was Tom Kane. And the more Tom got out and spoke and explained what he was trying to do, the economy was coming back. We had some victories in the legislature. By, by the time I went, by the time 1984 ended, um, which was going into the fourth and final year, um, I think there was a sense that the ship had been righted and we had some, some wind behind the sails. And you think the fundamental change was that Greg Stevens got the governor out of the governor's office more? I think that's one of them. And I think also there were internal battles within the administration. 
and rather than let them go on and on, he'd just say, all right, let's make a decision and go with it. And again, I had, when he came on board, it was basically a month or so before I went back to the insurance department. So I wasn't there for a lot of this, but this is my perception as an outsider sitting in a department. What was Kane's approach to uh, his cabinet? Was it uh, uh, laissez-faire as opposed to uh, management from the governor's office? One of the things I've often thought about is the fact that in his hiring process, he went out and he got good people. It wasn't good buddies. I don't think he ever knew Ken Biederman. Uh, the environmental DEP, he got Bob Huey, uh, who was uh, from South Jersey. I don't think he'd ever met Bob Huey. Uh, he went out and got a lot of people that he had confidence in, and he got people that he thought he could trust and he let them come back with plans. He didn't micromanage. He didn't say, you will do this. Clearly the plans were reviewed by the front office, uh, but he gave uh, a lot of, of leeway to the department heads and that was very good. I've, I've heard about other governors or presidents that essentially micromanage. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard about governors who went off to become cabinet secretaries in different administrations in Washington, and they talk about how they were reporting some 25-year-old kid in the White House who was running everything. And that's not the way Tom handled his cabinet. So you stayed at the insurance department until December of 84? Four. Uh, and then w what was your next assignment? Uh, Gary Stein had been appointed to the Supreme Court. By the governor? By the governor. And I came back to run policy and planning. Was that a natural fit for you? Sounds I liked like it because my background really was public policy, and um, um, I remember hiring a planner. It was policy and planning, and I a, a lot of the issues having to do with urban growth. You know, look at what's happening on Route One, or was happening at the time, with different people putting together uh, uh, or giving permission to build rateables on property and causing other problems. Um, so I, I thought it would be a good idea to have a planner there. I think the major issue, um, and, and I, um, the, the, I stopped doing policy and planning. I became an issue manager for one issue the first summer that I was there, and that was asbestos in the schools. Um, the first year, or the year before that, it had become an issue. Parents were terrified um, that their kids were going to come down with asbestosis. Um, uh, in March, or I came back in December, March or April, I realized that there was this issue out there that Gary Stein had begun working on. And I knew that if we did not control this really tightly, then we'd be uh, in September with a lot of schools closed. So starting in sometime in the spring, uh, March or April, uh, I became an issue manager running the uh, asbestos removal program in the public schools in New Jersey. Out of the governor's office? Out of the governor's office. We had representatives of the cabinet come in to, I think it was weekly meetings. Originally it was every twice a month, and then it became once a week. And we were on top of what was going on at every school. If there were any issues, uh, we would blast through and get to a contractor if there were contractor problems. We wanted to make sure that by the end of August, if there were going to be any delays, we would know about it. We can convey it to the parents. We could explain what was going on. I think there were three schools that opened late that year. One was a week or two late, and the other were open the end of September. But I think that um, the bulk of my time in policy and planning was really spent managing that one issue so that the schools would open on time in September, and, and they did. Were you worried about Kane's reelection at all? Uh, no. Were you in? Were you involved in the re-election no. campaign? You just were involved in the government. Right. Uh, was it clear to you that he would be re-elected? Yes. Why? In order not to be re-elected, you needed to do something that would aggravate people. And I think more and more Tom like, was liked by the people. Uh, all the polls showed that he was very well liked. Uh, the economy was on an upswing, uh, and Tom had accomplished most of what he had said he was going to do. Uh, he put together a, I put together a list for him uh, when I went to the insurance department of, I'd, I'd 
part of my job, I was keeping record of all the promises he had made during the campaign. So we had a list of what he had promised and what he had actually done, and he was, on a percentage basis, extremely consistent. So I think the people had no reason to reject him. And the Democrats nominated Peter Shapiro that year. How did you regard him? Uh, I'd met him a couple times. He was a nice, young, bright guy. He was the Essex County Executive. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think Governor Florio had decided not to run, which is sort of the handwriting on the wall that he didn't think he could win. And there was just a general perception that whoever the candidate won, wh whoever the candidate was, was going to be a sacrificial lamb. And I think that's the way it turned out to be. I think he had the, we, after going from the closest election in the history of the state, we had the biggest uh, win in the history of the state. All right, let's 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 stop there at the end of the first term. Great. Ken, while we were changing tapes, you recalled uh, a story about the legislative veto. Tell us that story. The um, legislature uh, decided to object to a regulation that was implemented by the Kane administration. And earlier, under Governor Byrne's term, uh, the um, uh, legislature had passed a legislative veto, which gave, I think it was over Governor Byrne's veto, which gave the legislature the right to reject uh, regulations promulgated by the executive branch. So it was, it was an issue between branches of government. It wasn't by a simple partisan issue. By majority, issue. they could undo I think regulations? It was, I think it was a majority, but either a majority, two thirds majority, whatever. Not a partisan issue, but just an institutional issue executive branch versus legislative branch. Uh, and the governor uh, went to uh, to respond to that that uh, lawsuit, and because the Office of Administrative Law was technically responsible for the regulation, the Attorney General had to represent the Office of Administrative Law. So the governor of New Jersey wanted to be represented individually as an officer, and Governor Byrne went to Governor Kane and said, you know, I believe in this so strongly, let me represent you. So the, uh, uh, the governor of New Jersey, in this case, was defended by co-counsel, including uh, Governor Byrne and myself. Remember what year this might have been? 83, maybe late 82, early 83. And I do remember that we met with Governor Byrne and we had agreed that uh, uh, Governor, B governor Byrne would handle one portion of the argument, I would handle another portion of the argument, and there was a third counsel, Jack Trope, who would handle the last part of the argument. And when uh, Governor Burns stood up to speak to the uh, court, uh, he reminded the members of the Supreme Court that he had appointed each and every one of them and would take it as a personal affront if they did not agree with him on this matter. And I remember sitting there shaking, saying, oh my God, what do I do? You know, they have to take it from him, but they don't have to take it from me, and they're going to tear me to pieces. Uh, but they uh, they were very nice and uh, treated we, me with uh, probably much more courtesy than I deserved. And how did they rule? They ruled in Governor Burns favor. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have a legislative veto in New Jersey anymore. Uh, actually, I think they redid it uh, or redrafted it, and I think it does stand. Uh. Um, Kane trounced Peter Shapiro in the election of 1985. No surprise, you said earlier. You weren't involved in getting him reelected. You were uh, back running policy and planning. Let me ask you about some issues uh, that the office. You say you were involved in getting asbestos out of the schools, and that that was your total focus. But uh, during your time at policy and planning, uh, the office took up prison overcrowding. Do you remember uh, the the issue? No. Uh, Health care, uh, the DRG system, certi certificate of need regulations, uncompensated care, uh, UMDNJ, things we still talk about today. Remember any of the handling of that? I remember generally, and I, I remember that uh, along with uh, Molly Coy, who was the new commissioner of health at that point, there was an effort to try to stem the rise in medical costs. Clearly, there are people that needed to be helped. Uh, clearly, the medical system was becoming very, very expensive, even in those days. 
And the question was, what do we do about it? Uh, we knew at the time uh, that we had too many hospitals, too many hospital beds, that even in the 1980s, medical care was improving to the point where for a procedure that would require a hospital stay of two weeks or three weeks previously, you were in and out of the hospital in a matter of a day or two. Uh, and the, the big issue that I recall was the certificate of need process. What do you need to do to show that you should be designated as a heart center, a uh, heart surgery center? What we learned is that in order to be a good hospital, technically competent in a particular type of surgery, you needed to perform a number of surgeries per year whether it was 500 or 1,000. You needed to have a staff that was fully staffed 24 hours a day, so you needed three teams of nurses. Beyond the doctors, the skilled nurses that participated in the surgery were very important to the quality of care rendered. Every, every hospital in the state could not be the excellent center of care for everything uh, that ailed the people of New Jersey. And yet, hospitals are job centers employment centers, they're a matter of local pride, local uh, hospitals always sound good in case you do get sick, you're, you're close by. Uh, we were trying to figure out a way that we could um, uh, try to stop people from giving money to hospitals. In other words, put up a plaque that said John Doe refused to give money to put up a building here uh, to make it more honorable to not fund a hospital because that was in the state's interest. I'm, I'm carrying that to an extreme. But the fact is, we, we recognize those issues. Uh, they were very early on in the process, and I do remember working on them, but I can't recall the, the details of what we did. Uh, insurance reform, auto insurance reform, tort reform, you've talked a little bit about uh, auto insurance reform. Were they successful, those initial reforms? There are, uh, some of them were very successful. Uh, uh, the reforms that led to the modernization of the department I think we're incredibly successful. Uh, we started a national mode towards computerized financial solvency, uh, which was picked up by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners within a matter of a year or two. So the insurance regulatory apparatus now nationally is in much better shape than it was. Um, I've spoken with a number of people that had said if the uh, SEC uh, had done for the mortgage business, what we did for the insurance solvency business, the, the stuff that happened over the last couple of years would never have happened. But they didn't have the type of system that we implemented over 20 years ago. Uh, uh, there was a new process for regulating agents and brokers, for licensing them, that um, worked very, very well. Uh, there were some things that we did in the health insurance area. Uh, in the life insurance area, again, in terms of solvency, in terms of regulation, that worked very well. And there were a lot of things that worked very well um, outside of the residual market, the JUA. Uh, we did implement the higher monetary threshold. Uh, we did implement a number of other reforms. We put together a fraud bureau, which is really doing an, an excellent job by the end of the 1980s. Uh, but the big failure was the residual market, the residual auto market. Uh, which had been a problem in the 70s, became a bigger problem in the early 80s, and was the biggest problem as we left office. The JUA. The JUA. What was the problem? The generic problem was that there was a large residual market in New Jersey. That means people that could not get insurance from anybody. And there was an, another system, the assigned risk plan, in which different insurance companies were told they had to write a particular risk. The JUA took essentially a certain number of insurance car companies that were carriers, that were basically managers of, um, for a certain number of vehicles in the new residual market. And it allowed those carriers to run um, the insurance operation for a certain number of citizens of the state of New Jersey. A couple of problems. Number one, the residual market continued to grow. I think uh, when Governor Kane came in, it was in the mid-30% of the population of the state was in the residual market. Um, by the time we left office, it was roughly 50% of the state was in the residual market. Uh, second thing was the, um, the law that was enacted um, did not anticipate some of the problems that the department would have in terms of regulating what was going on. In other words, we just had no capacity internally, no computers, no nothing. We had a 
rely on outside advisors and we didn't get accurate information for a couple of years. By the time we got that information, and I remember at my uh, nomination hearing the second time around before Senate Judiciary Committee, we were talking about whether there was a problem there. And I remember talking about how concerned I was about the deficit. But it takes years to figure out exactly what it was. Um, the system that was set up to compensate the JUA for losses basically amounted to surcharges on individual drivers who had done certain things. Uh, the legislature found that the citizens, citizens of the state didn't like that, so they started trimming back on the money flow. Uh, but clearly it was a, a disaster uh, waiting, to, uh, waiting to happen. Um, we did a lot of good things um, in terms of the uh, rate making process for the voluntary market. Uh, there was something called ISO, Insurance Services Office, which filed for rates for 95 percent of the drivers at one time. We broke that up so that not everybody had the same rate. The rate was based on experience. There was an excess profits law that plowed excess profits when there were some back to the policyholders. Uh, but I think one of the greatest failures of the Kane years was the auto residual market. You went back to the Department of Insurance right. at what point in time? That was in the spring of 1986. To be commissioner? Right. Uh, environmental issues, uh, water supply, asbestos you've spoken about, low level radioactive waste resource recovery and solid waste management, pine lands implementation. Any of those kick up any memories? Not really. No, I, I think the, uh, again, the, the time that I spent at policy and planning, which was roughly 14 months, most of that time was spent on my own individual time, was managing the process abatement process. Uh, the issues that I do recall in particular ones regarding planning. Uh, it was the Office of Policy and Planning. Uh, I admittedly didn't know a darn thing about planning, urban planning, regional planning. Uh, so we hired someone who did and... Who was that? A guy by the name of Chuck Newcomb, who as I recall came out of uh, Burlington County. Um, uh, and at least he gave us, what he gave us was access into the planning community. and over that year we were able to put together a process for allowing the state to start grappling formally with issues that we all knew existed. Uh, were you involved in the state planning issue, uh, the state planning commission issue? We helped, I believe, during that year set up what became that process, but by the time they actively started meeting I was back at the insurance department. Were you involved in the creation of the the Council on Affordable Housing, the Fair Housing Act, responding to the Mount Laurel decision? Not that I can recall. Uh, what was Governor Kane like as a boss? He's great. Again, a lot of flexibility. Uh, he wanted new ideas. He did not want you to come back and tell him what you thought he wanted to hear. He wanted the truth. Uh, and he wanted what was going to work in the best interest of the state. How much interaction would you have with him in a typical week when you were in policy and planning? Uh, on a daily basis. I can't, I mean, some, there are days where he was not in Trenton. There are days when he was in Trenton that I did not need to see him, but as needed, I would see him as often as need be. You enjoyed his company? Very much. Uh, did you discern any change in how he governed in the second term as compared to the first term? I think there was a lot more confidence. And again, I think that started in 84. Uh, again, things began turning around. And uh, there was more of a recognition that he was going to succeed as the leader. Success breeds success. I think that um, what we haven't discussed at all was the persona of Tom Kane, which I think resonated really well with the people of the state. Let's talk about that. Uh, he, he wanted the state to be better than I think the state perceived itself as being in those years. Um, and I think that um, uh, Kane was sort of derided both in the primary and the general election of 1981 as being a patrician. But I think ultimately that worked in his favor because I think everybody in the state that was paying attention knew that Tom Kane had no ulterior motive. So he could do something, for example, in travel and tourism, 
and you'd stand up there with this hokey, you know, New Jersey and you perfect, perf I can't even do it, perfect together uh, commercials. Uh, and the state responded really well to that. Uh, they, they liked the guy and they knew that he was saying, you know, we are number two in blueberries. And it, it meant something to him that we did have an agricultural base or we have the shore, we have the skylands, we have all those things that made us a great state. Uh, Tom used to quote Ben Franklin who said that uh, New Jersey was a keg that was tapped at both ends. And he really believed in the identity of New Jersey. So I think that's something that, that um, uh, he knew that people were responding to. Um, did you, w were there changes in uh, relationships among his staff second term as opposed to first term? Were the players the same? Were the uh, Carrie moved over to the Attorney General's office. Uh, Mike Cole came in as Chief Counsel. Uh, uh, Greg was there, I think, until just about the end. As um, I think Ed McGlynn came in at some yeah, point. Yeah, 88 time. or 89 towards the end. Towards the real end, there was a lot of shuffling, but I think uh, 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 Brenda Davis came over from DEP uh, to take over for me at uh, Policy and Planning. So clearly, there were all sorts of changes in the second term. Uh, did you sense that the Democrats in Trenton uh, felt chastened by the landslide that they had just experienced uh, against them? No. No, and, and I, I, I say that because they knew it was Tom Kane. I don't think the Democrats seriously believed that New Jersey had become a Republican state. I think it's like, okay, now we'll start preparing for 1989. Uh, Kane did bring a change in the assembly majority with yep. him. Uh, Republicans did take control of the assembly after the 85 election. Um, Alan Karcher was the chief antagonist of Tom Kane uh, during the first term, and right, particularly before the election of 85. Uh, did you get a sense that he perhaps overplayed his hand in challenging Kane? I think the feeling was that Allen bled partisan politics and he was there to represent his party or what he perceived as the best interests of his party, not necessarily what was best for the people of New Jersey. So whenever there was an issue, uh, urban enterprise zones, this issue, that issue, there's very little support to be found from Alan Karcher. Uh, it was a blood sport, and Alan played it that way. You think that was a mistake on Alan's part? I, I think that, that Tom Kane would have won re-election in 85 anyway, again, because of the reasons that I've, I've discussed. Um, but I think that um, uh, from our perspective, it was always no, 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 and, and there was never any common ground. The 80s were uh, generally uh, a time of prosperity in the country. Um, you were talking a moment ago about Tom Kane trying to make New Jerseyans feel good about themselves as New Jerseyans. To what extent do you think he was successful in that by the end of his two terms? I think by the end of his two terms he was very successful. Uh, I think there was a pride that people felt about New Jersey. Uh, and. Um, uh, I, I didn't mention that early on um, uh, New Jersey was impacted by the app scam issues down in Washington. Senator Williams was forced to resign. Uh, we lost uh, one or two congressmen uh, in that process. Uh, a number of political bosses uh, went down. Uh, and again, that was another uh, slam at New Jersey. While there were other people involved, people involved in app scam from other states, uh, there were several people from New Jersey, and again, it was a blow to the state's self-image. And I think by appointing someone like Nick Brady uh, as the senator to replace Harrison Williams, again, this is not a guy who, who came out of the, the political process. This is a fellow who had no ulterior motive, who was clearly bright and educated. Um, I, I think through his appointments, um, Tom led, led a tone of dignity. I don't remember any scandals that came out of the Kane administration, uh, by the way he handled himself, uh, by positions he took, um, he just, he, he made us feel good about ourselves. And the other thing that I, I've 
I'd say at this point is um, I don't go to Trenton all that often, but in the years that I do run into someone from Trenton, uh, former state worker, current state worker, former reporter, what they all seem to say was that Tom's people treated folks with dignity, that there was, uh, people were not berated, people, state workers anyway were not berated, were not looked down upon. Um, uh, the reporters that I know are former reporters would say that as a group, they felt that we were more open. So I, I think that everybody felt good about what was going on for a lot of different reasons. And there's a period of American history called the Year of Good Feelings. I forget what period it was, but it just kind of, um, it, it felt like that's the way it was in the 80s. You spent the remainder of the administration as insurance commissioner, yes. is that correct? Right up until the end? Bitter end. Um, you just spoke of an era of good feelings. When you think back on the eight years of Kane, uh, is there a single accomplishment? Are there are there a couple of highlight accomplishments of the Kane administration in your view? This is 20 years later, uh, and I think the most lasting accomplishment of a vision of what government can be when it operates properly. Uh, a lot of people don't like government. A lot of people don't believe in government or want to rip it down. I think Tom Kane always wanted to use government to do the right thing, to help people. And I think that through a number of the initiatives that the Kane administration had, uh, that worked out uh, on the environmental side, uh, on the, the uh, law enforcement side. Um, I, I can't quote him chapter and verse right now, but what I can say is there is a feeling among even his partisan opponents that Tom was trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. They may have disagreed with the ways. Alan Karcher might have had a different view as to how to resolve car insurance, uh, but no one ever said that Tom Kane uh, was doing things because he was motivated by the wrong reasons. What do you think about uh, the path Kane chose for himself after the governorship? Uh, there were opportunities to run for the U.S. Senate, which he passed on. He became president of Drew University and chaired the 9-11 Commission, and now is a kind of elder statesman uh, of the Republican Party in New Jersey, probably the elder statesman of the Republican Party. Uh, did he miss an opportunity? Did he do just what you would have expected? Uh, how do you view his post-gubernatorial career? I'm not sure I'm the best person to evaluate it. I think that Tom Kane would tell you that he's extremely happy with the way it's played out. I do know that when he was president of Drew University, uh, he relished the opportunity to be with uh, the young students on that campus. Uh, uh, I know from several people, including Tom, that uh, he, he had taught a class up there, a seminar class, and, and he, he really enjoyed just sitting down and talking with these young kids about uh, whatever the issues were. Uh, and he enjoyed being in the academic environment and helping improve uh, the financial base uh, as well as the visibility of uh, Drew University. So I, I think that's, um, that's an incredibly uh, uh, great thing for, for Tom Kane as an individual to have done. What did you do after leaving the administration? Uh, practice law with the firm in New York. I had so many conflicts of interest in New Jersey because of the, uh, I think everybody in the world was suing me all the insurance company, so it kind of knocked out any law firm in New Jersey. But I went to a New York firm, uh, did international law, insurance law for a while, uh, and then practiced law in New Jersey for a while. And for the last eight years, I've been running a nonprofit foundation in New York City. And what does it do? Uh, it works with children in New York City, Boston, and to a lesser extent, Newark, New Jersey, uh, primarily on education issues, primarily minority uh, underserved kids. The uh, name of the foundation? The Charles Hayden Foundation. And what does it do with the kids? Uh, we support after school education programs, uh, weekend programs, uh, uh, we do a little bit of scholarship work, uh, we do summer camps, we do a lot of programs that impact kids directly, uh, and most of it is oriented towards education, getting them into college. Who was, who was or is Charles Hayden? Charles Hayden was born and raised and educated in Boston uh, public schools, went to MIT, came down to Wall Street, made a ton of money, 
uh, while he was alive, he helped build the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. And when he died in the 1930s, he left his entire estate uh, to be used for children uh, in New York and uh, in Boston. How large an organization is the foundation? Uh, the foundation, in terms of size of, of the employees, is very small. Myself included, there are five employees. Uh, it currently has about uh, $260 million, which is down considerably from what it had about a year ago. Uh, but uh, we've given out uh, close to $400 million, and um, I think his bequest was in the $32, $34 million range. So. Um, do you have any contact with Tom Kane anymore? I speak to him on rare occasions. Uh, I last saw Tom, I guess, I think we had lunch a year or two ago in New York City. Like him as much as you did? Absolutely. In 1981? Absolutely. Uh, you spent eight years in Trenton. Uh, looking back, what's gone right and what's gone wrong? in New Jersey politics and government? People go into government for different reasons. And looking at it from the standpoint of legislators, they want to do stuff for people in their district. And that stuff frequently entails spending money. And all legislators, Republicans and Democrats, are generally loath to raise taxes. But they all want to do stuff. And when you do stuff that costs money and you don't have the money to pay for it, bad things happen. And I think there have been a succession of legislators and governors, uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, who have refused to grapple with the tough issues. As we sit here today, the uh, governor of New York State, uh, Governor Patterson, uh, who had been a state senator and was in favor of spending tons of money, has come out and said, we can't do it. We don't have the money. We have to shut down programs, good programs, programs that are working, but we just don't have the money to run them. Um, and he's, I've, I've really admired and respected what he's doing, kind of running against Democrats and Republicans who are willing to go as far as he is to say, we're going to bring this budget back into balance. Uh, so I, I think um, uh, a number of folks on, in both parties have just not had the, uh, the guts to deal with the tough issues. And now they have to have the guts because uh, revenues are drying up, is that correct? Well, we'll see if they have the guts. Uh, I think, um, uh, unfortunately for the people of the state, uh, uh, we're going to see more budget games, more uh, playing around with uh, budget projections, with revenue projections. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, before we wrap up, um, what are your current personal in interests? Well, uh, I, I think the most important thing from uh, a life experience perspective is through the foundation I've met a number of um, children that I've gotten to know pretty well. Uh, and I've adopted uh, uh, two uh, uh, young women that I've gotten to know. Uh, one is a senior in college, one is a junior in college. And uh, one of the best things that's happened to me in my life is getting to meet those two girls. You adopted two young women. Uh, are you married or are you a single parent? I am a single parent. You're a single parent. How long have you had these adopted children? Uh, I met them when they were in high school. And it's sort of an unofficial adoption that we've agreed to uh, make formal when they graduate from uh, college. So, uh, What do they want to do with their lives? Do you know yet? That's a good question. Uh, one is interested in technology management information systems. Uh, the other one is studying Chinese and wants to become an international lawyer uh, and live in Beijing. And how often do you see them? Uh, as often as I can. Uh, it's, uh, they're back in New York occasionally from school. And Where I do they visit go to them. school? Uh, the seniors at George Washington University and the juniors at Brown. Interesting. Unusual. Yeah, but it works. It's great. Uh, you, uh, you say it's informal. You're not legally their yeah. father, correct? Right. Uh, in New Jersey, you can adopt an adult 
and we've agreed that I would do that after uh, they graduate. You can adopt an adult? In New Jersey, yeah. I think 30 some odd states permit that. Uh -huh. And you have a relationship that takes you to Washington, D.C.? Get down there on occasion. Uh, any final thoughts on Kane before we wrap up for the day? Uh, he is who he is. He's, he's unique. Uh, I think he represents the best of what um, uh, a political leader, uh, a statesman, uh, can and should be. And I came into this with an enormous respect for him based upon um, the, the common knowledge about the Kane family in Livingston, New Jersey, where I grew up. Uh, and I leave with a, a knowledge that um, everything I'd heard when I was a kid was absolutely true. He's a, a fine man. He's a gentleman. He cares about people. Um, he is very, very genuine. And uh, knowing him has been one of the, the best experiences of my life. And he has spawned another generation of Keynes in public service. He has. Do you know Tom Kane Jr.? I do. My first recollection of Tom Kane Jr. was when he and his twin brother uh, were uh, running around in um, army uniforms. They were about eight or ten years old at the time, and they were playing war or something, and happened to find out that I had been in a war, and so we had a nice conversation like you'd have with an eight or a ten-year-old, and, and lo and behold, they've uh, gone on to become real adults. And one of them's in politics. One of them is. Right. Uh, and one's not. Maybe those are the two sides of Tom Kane Sr., Thanks very much for talking to us, Ken. Thank you, Michael.